Coming up on DTNS, weep for the headphone jack, my friends, why voice assistants need to spy on you, and should an AI be able to get a patent for its own inventions? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, August 1st, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From the shores of Lake Merritt, I'm Justin Robert Young. And uh, from the L.A. County area, I'm the show's producer, Roger Jane. Sarah Lane uh, on the second of three days off uh, working on some other projects right now. She'll be back on Monday. Uh, but we were just having a wonderful conversation of what we suspect might show up at a new theme park that Universal Studios is apparently developing out in Orlando. That's on Good Day Internet. Uh, and the only way to get that is to become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Sources tell the Wall Street Journal that the U.S. Federal Trade Commission is investigating Facebook's acquisitions. The FTC wants to determine if Facebook bought rivals mainly in order to prevent them from becoming a threat to Facebook's business, which could fall afoul of regulations. Tyler Blevins, a.k.a. Ninja, one of Twitch's most popular streamers, announced he's moving his stream exclusively to Microsoft Mixer. Microsoft Mixer is a product that Microsoft has to have people stream their video games to, if you didn't know. He said his streams will be exactly the same, so more Fortnite. Ninja will appear at Lollapalooza in Chicago this weekend, too, which is being streamed live on YouTube. So he's he's all over the map. Hmm. Google confirmed it's testing Play Pass in the Play Store, a $4.99 monthly service that offers a library of games and apps. Apps in Play Pass would have ads removed and include all in-app purchases as well. Screenshots of the test list uh, features a fitness tracker, premium music apps, and puzzle games that would be included. Nice. All right, let's talk a little bit about Intel. Big announcement. Uh, Intel announced the first 11 processors in its 10th generation Ice Lake line. This is for thin and light laptops. Ice Lake is built on Intel's 10 nanometer Sunny Cove architecture, which Intel claims can handle 18% more instructions per clock, along with larger L1 and L2 cache. Sunny Cove also brings Intel's AVX512 Deep Learning Boost, which speeds up automatic image enhancements, photo indexing, media post-processing, a few other AI tasks. So bringing in better battery efficiency, more power, and a lot more AI capability to these thin and lights. The model numbers will get even longer too. In fact, The Verge and uh, I believe Enantec both had really good how to figure out what the model number means decoding rings. Uh, but basically, uh, you're going to end up with three different graphic options with Ice Lake chips. If you see G7 in the model number, that means you're getting 64 execution units. G4 means 48 execution units. Both of those models have the Iris Plus graphics. If you see G1, that means not Iris Plus and just 32 execution units. As usual, the Y series chips won't have a Y in the model number name, but the Y series chips will be meant for slim and efficient machines. Uh, they're coming rated for nine watts or 12 watts, which is bigger than the last round. And for the first time, there'll be a quad core Y series model. U-series chips will be geared towards ultra portables, rated for 15 watts or 25 watts. Ice Lake also includes support for Wi-Fi 6 and up to four Thunderbolt 3 ports. So that doesn't have to be bolted on afterwards. That's a little more efficient as well. 10th Gen Ice Lake chips will arrive in 35 laptops, including Dell's XPS 13 2-in-1, Acer Swift 5, and a bunch of others. You know, the upshot here is uh, if you're looking for a portable, if you're looking for a 2-in-1 or a thin and light, ultra portable, uh, you're going to have a bunch more capabilities once these Intel chips show up. Yeah. Uh, uh, does it mean that I need to get a new laptop, though, Tom? No, uh, it doesn't. They're not that much better. Uh, it, it means if you're in the market for a new laptop, uh, maybe hold off until these 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 hit the the market before you upgrade. Uh, but I don't think you have to go ditch your your existing laptop if it's doing well for you. Uh, Roger, I know you're you follow this chip stuff really closely. Does this feel like just a normal announcement? Does it have you excited? What, what what's your feeling? Uh, in terms of excitement, you know, it's it's something to expect. I think the most exciting part is that they're getting their 10 nanometer process down to the part where they can start you know regularly uh producing out these chips um and these are for and, and these chips are intended for the mobile market so they're they're not performance screamers right you're not going to be gaming you're not going to be doing any heavy workload uh but if you're looking for something that 
does everything you want want it to, but uses a lot less juice while it does it. Uh, these definitely are the products that Intel wants to put forward. Um, I guess really what's what's what will be fun to look at is to see what they come out in terms of desktop chips uh, later on uh, when they get to that point. But right now, sure. it's it, it feels like they just want to make sure they got this process down. They get these chips out. Um, you know, non tech. The early results is at most eighteen percent. Roughly, like kind of what what Intel spec'd out in terms of performance from advantage, but you know it's still early, and those were just uh, uh, test samples that they were letting journalists uh, play around with. It, we'll have to wait until the actual production units come out that uh, people can spend more time on instead of a couple hours to get a real feel of of where these are at in the performance scale. So yeah, if you're a chip head, there's some interesting stuff to look at here. Uh, if you're just wanting to know uh, whether to buy a laptop, again. Don't ditch the laptop you have if it's working great, but if you're in the market to buy a new one and you're looking for two-in-ones on ultralights and thin-in lights, uh, maybe wait until these this new generation shows up and evaluate them. Sandmobile.com claims leaks uh, that, uh, uh, sorry, claims a leaked render of a USB-C to mini jack adapter comes from Samsung and is meant to be bundled with the forthcoming Galaxy Note 10 and 10 Plus. If valid, this means that the new Note does not have a headphone jack. Samsung has an announcement scheduled for August 7th. Somebody check on Neelai Patel. Has anybody talked to him? Is he okay? Is he all right? Or is he ripped his clothes in the morning? Uh, yeah, there, there is some wailing and gnashing of teeth going out on out there, uh, because if you don't know, a lot of folks who are fans of the Note 10 often point to the fact that while my Note 10 still has a headphone jack as a point of pride, um, and yes, we are not yet in the world where nobody needs a headphone jack. Uh, but these flagship phones very often uh, can, get, again, give you a dongle for your USB-C port, or uh, most most likely they they did it with with head with uh, mo Samsung models that had headphone jacks. They gave you wireless earbuds free with purchase as a promote as a short time promotion. I will guarantee you they will do that with the Galaxy Note 10 and 10 Plus if this turns out to be a true render, which it seems like it should. Uh, we're going to find out next week, of course, but. Uh, Man, I I love the headphone jack. I'm using one right now on a tablet uh, to to play these these sorts of sound effects and 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 music cues and stuff. It is necessary sometimes, but I also know the wave of the future is good, reliable wireless. And uh, if you can bring the price down, uh, make it a little lighter, provide me some extra features, and not have to put that headphone jack apparatus in there, I think it's sometimes a reasonable trade off. I I don't want to. Step on to this holy war battlefield for which some folks uh, really like to rage. Uh, I know that it is a very, very particular interest for some people that there is a, a feeling of betrayal by some of these companies that they have abandoned a piece of technology that always works and never needs to be charged. However, it's becoming more of a niche element of phones. You are going to have to seek out a phone to do it because I do believe, uh, like you said, Tom, that this is just the way the technology is going. And uh, I have to say, I, despite the fact that I've recently gone on a run of losing them, uh, uh, I really like my AirPods. I, I like the idea that I can just pull them out and it stops uh, playing. And, and again, these are things I like the fact that uh, uh, I never get them caught on my handle of my suitcase and they rip violently out of my ear. Uh, uh, there are just things that I appreciate about wireless. You can do things with certain wireless that if you get the battery at a certain point, which I think it's close to now, then it, it is for me a preferable experience. And that just looks like where we're going with all of it. Yeah, and, and the headphone jack hasn't been the headphone jack on phones for a while. There are things that I plug into it that it's like, I don't understand that because it's a smart jack. It's not an actual fully implemented analog jack. And once that happened, I became less attached to it. It's kind of the same thing that happened when I'm like, damn it, they're getting rid of the, the component video for HDMI, but that's that's digital. You know what? We all got used to it. And it has its downsides. Don't get me wrong, but I imagine we'll get used to this too. A report from CounterPoint Research shows that overall smartphone shipments declined 1% to 360 million units in Q2 2019. That's the seventh consecutive quarter of decline. So if it hasn't sunk in yet, uh, the smartphone market has reached its peak. Uh, the report found that the combined market share of Chinese manufacturers, Huawei, Oppo, Vivo, Xiaomi, and Realme, 
reached a new high of 42%, even as smartphone shipments in China fell 9%. So the only manufacturers doing well in the smartphone market right now are the Chinese manufacturers. Samsung still remains the market share leader. Kind of feels like Nokia, you know, mid 2000s. Uh, it even grew shipments 7.1% on the year though. So that's good. Huawei remained at number two, growing its shipments 4.6%. Uh, the impact of U.S. trade sanctions probably not going to be felt until Q3. Uh, so we'll we'll see what happens in the next quarter if Huawei can hold on to that number two spot. Apple saw its third quarter of decline with shipments falling 11% on the year, but did remain number three. Uh, and following massive growth in India, you may have heard me mention the Chinese OEM Realme just now. Realme grew shipments more than 800% on the year, I think like 848% to enter the top 10 um, because uh, they're targeting India. Uh, Realme is, has moved into India in a big way. Strategy Analytics had their numbers out. They, they showed an identical top five. Uh, numbers varied in percentage points. They estimated 3% decline overall in the smartphone market. But essentially, uh, the same conclusions can be drawn from both sets of numbers, which is no surprise, Justin, the smartphone market is, uh, is not a vibrant market anymore. It's a and commodity. That's what it is. That's what it, it is. Yeah. It, it just, look, you're going to get a lot of phones that are, are, the good news is that it's never been a better time to have multiple phones or buy cheaper phones that have really, really, really good close to the high end functionality and features, because that's what happens in a, in, in a commodity market is the difference between the top, the middle and the bottom gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And the price tags get lower, lower and lower. I don't know where we're going with this, uh, but you know, we had an interesting conversation before, uh, the show about like, hey, look, we are we are kind of fresh out of the horses that galloped with us for uh, a, a decade and a half of growth hardware industries. And this is another example of one of them, the smartphone slowing down. Yeah, uh, it, it shouldn't really be a shock. And uh, like we saw Nokia and BlackBerry recede in the advance of, of Samsung, LG and Apple, uh, we're seeing Samsung and Apple uh, recede in, in the advance of these new commodity makers. Uh, and that's just the evolution of the marketplace. It's not because they're in China. It's because these are companies that figured out how to make commodities at a cheaper price point. And I don't think Apple cares. Samsung no. probably does because Samsung tries to do the commodity market and the flagship market, but Apple's only ever been in the flagship market. So as long as they, they can keep selling their average price uh, per unit up, uh, that's, that's, that's all they're going to care about is, is bringing in that money as they transition into a services company. Anyway, uh, they just need to have enough of those models out there, uh, that, that they can sell those services. So this is, this is not shocking. No. Me. Microsoft announced that it's testing a cloud download feature for Windows 10 that would allow users to reinstall Windows from a failed state by a download. Microsoft offers a similar feature to, quote, recover from the cloud, unquote, on Surface devices. The feature isn't available for public testing, and Microsoft did not say if it was coming to Windows Insider Builds. The Verge speculates that it could be an important feature for Windows Lite and Windows Core OS. Yeah, that's their Chromebook type uh, uh, competitor that they want to get out there, you know, for for real simple laptops. Uh, and that's meant for people who don't want to put remember to put in a USB drive and things like that. You don't have a lot of room to keep a uh, restore image on a partition like like you might usually. It's not new to be able to do this. Third parties have done this. OEMs have done this. Uh, but having it come from Microsoft provides a certain amount of, of stability and uniformity. It's also much more difficult for Microsoft to do this than Apple. Apple does this already because Apple knows exactly what drivers it needs because it makes the hardware. Uh, and, and with Microsoft Windows Lite and Windows Core OS, they may have a better idea of the drivers they need. So I wouldn't be shocked to see this go only for Lite or Core OS at the beginning anyway. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to try to cover all the driver needs across multiple OEMs. Uh, so that might be why we're not seeing this in the Windows Insider builds too. I, I agree. And I think that for the lighter ones, it makes a lot of sense. There's less modifications that are done to, to those kinds of uh, uh, devices and the consumers are far different than your traditional PC user. And dare I say, Tom, that it might be a little bit of, it just works from the Microsoft side that you're just able to do something a little bit simpler uh, by way of the manu by way of the OS manufacturer. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 yes, 
Uh, on the other hand, th we're talking about a feature that is generally only needed when your computer is fully crashed. <laughs> so you're coming from, it didn't work at all to, uh, it just works to bring it back. That's what you yeah. want. That's what no, you exactly. Want. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. Uh, and Germany's Data Protection Commissioner announced it is investigating Google's practice of hiring contractors to review audio snippets from Google Assistant in order to improve speech recognition. This is something we've talked about in regard to the Amazon Echo. Uh, it is something that there have been reports on regarding Apple's Siri. Contractors have reported, in Google's case, hearing conversations accidentally recorded when the assistant was triggered by mistake. And that's happened with Amazon and Apple as well. Google says it will stop audio reviews and transcription in Europe for at least three months during this investigation. And Google says it only has been reviewing around 0.2%, 0 0.2, not 2%, 0.2% of clips and does not associate them with accounts. Uh, this is a bugaboo though, right? Nobody yeah. cares whether their voice was in here. Nobody cares what the percentage was. All they care about is hearing, wait, Google was listening to conversations. They could have heard me say a thing accidentally. They could have heard me do a thing accidentally. I don't like that. And the other side of this though, Justin, is this is the way you improve these assistants. That's why all three companies that are major manufacturers of these voice assistants are doing it. You take a very small sample, you don't associate it with any user information, and you review it to see like, oh, how well did it do? That's how you train these supervised learning AIs. Now, someday we'll have unsupervised learning and you won't have to do this, but that's not how they work right now. And if you want them to work better and better, you have to do this. One of the big problems is, of course, that well, they didn't tell me they were doing it or they told me in a weird way and I didn't understand or they kind of hid that they were doing it, et cetera, et cetera. Let's say, okay, they all improved their privacy policies to make it clear that they're doing this. Are you still uncomfortable with it? I'm not, but the divide here is between people that listen to this show who are very smart and normies who are scared and frightened by technology, or rather they are scared and frightened when they realize that technology is indeed building upon systems and not magic, that you're not just getting a magic cylinder that knows all these things, uh, uh, but, but rather this is something that needs to get better and better. And indeed it's the reason why some of these assistants are better at recognizing voices than other assistants because they are constantly improving. So, the, the, the problem that we that we face here is of education. And it reminds me a lot of ad targeting or cookies uh, uh, mm -hmm. that, that tech people know about. Uh, but the average person is like, wait a minute. I was I was literally just thinking about this thing. And next thing you know, it shows up on my uh, on this uh, website that I didn't even uh, uh, type it into. And it's like, yeah, because you're being followed around and, and the, the, the stuff you search for is being served to you on ads for websites that have nothing to do with where you search for it before. Uh, it, it is about education. And I do understand that now that we live in a world where these devices are fairly indispensable for a lot of households. They're tied into Internet of Things devices. People like them. People use them. Uh, I know now that I have a bunch of friends of mine with kids, they are uh, absolutely just a part of the household for the children. Uh, that now you can say very open and honestly, would you like to opt in to have your voice at this thing totally anonymized be a part of making this product better. I think a lot of people would sign up for it in a way that they might not have when these were first getting off the ground three, four right. years and, ago. Right, and come on, the tech companies can't be shocked about this, right? No. Like for, for years, for years, when you launch software or install a new OS, you get the prompt. Hey, would you like some of your information to be sent to Microsoft slash Apple slash Google to help us improve the product? Check yes or no, right? They they learned back then that they're like, yeah, we need this to make the product better, but we should always ask first just to make sure. And I think that's the brilliant solution to this. Just have, when you set up these things, say like, hey, uh, you know, it's probably not going to happen, but sometimes we may anonymously review your recordings to make sure they're working. That's going to make sure that accidental recordings don't happen more often. Are you cool with that? Yes or no? Uh, yeah. Tech companies don't want to do that because they don't want to have to deal with tracking which snippets they can use or not. Right now, they can just pull 0.2% out without thinking about it. Makes life easier. I get it. But you know what? People are upset about this, so you're going to have to deal with it. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. 
Professors from the University of Surrey and a Missouri-based inventor of a product called Davis AI, you may have heard of Davis AI creating art, uh, have filed patents in the United Kingdom, Europe, and the United States in the name of Davis AI, not the inventor, not the professors, saying this patent should be attributed to the artificial intelligence that created it. Uh, Davis AI has two patents, one for designing interlocking food containers using fractal designs that make it easier for a robot to grasp and move around. That could be useful in, in tons of production lines. It also is designing a warning light that flashes in a rhythm that mimics neural activity, making it harder to ignore. So sometimes you just get used to the like constant flashing of an alert and you're like, and you forget that it's there, right? This would flash in a way that would be harder for you to get used to. That's a really useful invention. But patent authorities generally require a person as the author of an invention. So there is no patent authority right now that is saying, oh, sure, no, we'll grant it to an artificial intelligence agent, uh, right? And the beneficiary of, will, of course, be the owner of that agent, whoever that is. Uh, BBC has a full article about this uh, with some some fairly you know non-committal stuff from the UK and the US. But a spokeswoman for the European Patent Office told the BBC that for the foreseeable future, AI is a tool used by a human inventor. Which that that's an interesting way to look at it because it's like okay, but then if your tool invents something, if your tool makes something happen, do you get credit for that, or does the tool? Because well, I, I can think about this in a way that's like, oh, well, these this guy invented the AI. He's running the AI. It made the thing. He should get credit for the patent, right? But an AI can be copied and distributed. And so if that AI is now used by me or you, does he get the credit or do I get the credit? Well, uh, all right. So there, there's a couple of things here. And, and, and let's take them from the most practical first. What is a patent for? Like what what disputes do a patent mediate? Uh, uh, primarily, it's who owns the thing. And if two people are doing it, we now have a record to say, OK, you stop doing it. Uh, right. And furthermore. And, and, the, and the point being, you want to encourage people to invent things. So yeah. you want someone to think like, well, if I spend time working on this invention, I'll be able to reap the benefits for a particular period of time around, you know, uh, 10 to 14 years, depending on the country. Right. And, and furthermore, to be able to have a database to check, Oh, has anybody done blank? And you look around, you're like, okay, it doesn't look like anybody's done blank or called it blank or had to be blank. Uh, so does it benefit an AI to have a patent or does it benefit the person who generates or directs the AI to have the patent? Because the AI is not going to be discouraged from inventing things. Yeah. Right. But would you, as the operator of the AI, be discouraged from using the AI to invent things if you couldn't patent it? Or Cause, are cause we in a situation? Otherwise, otherwise the, the, the greatest patent holder in the world is AutoCAD and Photoshop, right? Yeah. What are we in a situation where, hey, guess what? AI can create new things. We'll never have a situation where there is a disincentive to create. Because everyone can have an AI. So we don't need to encourage inventions because they're so easy to come about. And furthermore, uh, the AI can know to stay away from certain things because you could probably just uh, check it against the list of available patents and say, okay, yeah, just do everything except what I can't do because <laughs> we're, we're going we're gonna to block off these possible solutions. So if you're getting close to these solutions, understand you have to go further in or in a different direction. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually fascinated by this idea that uh, uh, you could have so many, you could have AI because it's infinitely copyable, right? Distributed across the globe, making inventions. And if you, and, and, and the reason for patents is to be like, yeah, but if we don't protect patents, then people won't create things. But you could point to this and say like, yeah, but that's not a problem anymore. Because the AIers are just inventing things all day long, whether you want them to or not, you just run it. Uh, and, 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 and so why wouldn't someone want to invent something and then just share it out. You you don't need that many people running AIs for that to happen. Shoot. Maybe you don't need the patent system anymore. Well, I mean, all right. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Uh, I know. It's crazy. It's crazy talk. I get it.
let, 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 let's, let, let, let's, let's stay in a world where we do keep the patent office. All right. Uh, let's bring it, let's bring it back to modern day where the patent person is like, yeah, okay, maybe someday. Right. But right now I have to figure out this interlocking food container. Does it go to the Missouri based inventor of Davis AI? Does it go to the professors uh, or does it go to nobody? Do, do I say yeah, that, like, well, software that's creator. the interesting idea. The interesting idea is that if it's not to the AI, which theoretically cannot reap the benefits uh, of, of such a distinction, but rather the people who initially created the AI. Now that would encourage creation of AIs with very specific skill sets, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and ease of use, because then the patents would on some level uh, be going to the people that created the initial AI. Well, and then, but then nobody's going to want to use it to create inventions because they're like, well, if I create an invention, those other guys that created this AI. So then you go back to saying, okay, what about the owner, the person who's running that instance of yeah. the AI? Well, I mean, would people? I mean, if it took you five minutes to do it instead of five years, and uh, the, the but then uh, suddenly I can, I'm restricted from using the thing that my AI just invented because it unless, belongs to somebody else. The creators of that AI are like, hey, look, you do what you want, just make. Well, sure if they do, face. but you but you know, companies, companies. But, but companies aren't going to do it. They're not going to be like, yeah, Fred, go ahead. We might own it. No, they're going to be like, if we're not sure we own no, it. No, if no, 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 no. We own a specific, uh, I think there, there's a tremendous business to say that you just own 10% of everything that gets created or. Well, or, that's different than what yeah. you were just describing. If, if, yeah, if, yeah. if the I, deal that's, is that's like, what I, that's what I was trying to get. We'll to. make an agreement where you can have this AI, but we own 10% of every patent that you get out of it. Sure. Then that could work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but that's, that but should that be the law? Should you be allowed to do that? Or should it be like, no, if, if you're running the AI, then you are the person using the tool and yeah. therefore you should get the credit for any patent that comes out of that. Look for right now, uh, uh, as, as anybody who deals with, uh, algorithms or artificial intelligence will tell you, uh, these are systems that although they are remarkable, also take a lot of direction to point them where you want them to go. These are not magic. They are not free thinking, uh, you know, consciousnesses that, you know, come up with brilliant things at the speed of computing. Uh, you, you They still very much at this point are tools, but 10 years in the future, yeah, we might be in a different position because and, obviously well, it is going in, in a different direction and they are being honed uh, more and more by people that are creating these systems. And to bring it back to today, if you're like, oh, well, then for now, no problem. It's just the person using the AI that gets the patent. No, that's the issue. Uh, and we we kind of danced around this issue. But the issue is, if the AI creates it, you didn't. And patent law, the way yeah. it's written right now, won't give you the patent for that because you didn't make it. And 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 so th there's basically just no patent law to deal with the situation because it wasn't a possible situation. Tools couldn't make things in the future. If you made something with a tool, you had to design it. But if you're like, well, my tool designed it. Now the patent office is like, oh, so you didn't design it. I can't give you the patent, but I can't give it to anybody. Uh, so the upshot is governments are going to have to come up with new laws uh, to to direct or patent offices might have to come up with new regulations to say in the case that an AI designed it, we are going to give the credit this way, but either there is way, no way to deal with it right now in the way patent law is written. Either way from beyond the grave, Thomas Edison in shambles. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Nikola Tesla still mad at him. He's <laughs> still in love with a pigeon. Yes. Hey, uh, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. We've got a couple things about that AC shirt, man. Y'all love the air-conditioned shirt because it's so hot. I get it. Uh, Mark wrote in and said, I wanted to pass along an interesting thought about that air-conditioned shirt from Sony. This sort of thing would be very useful in certain medical situations. My wife had MS and avoiding overheating was an important thing. Traditionally, using cool cooling bands draped over the shoulders had been used. However, if this shirt type system works well enough to just avoid getting too hot, even possibly while getting some exercise and is reasonably priced, it can be a big win for folks who have a medical need to avoid overheating, MS being just one kind of case. Uh, that's an excellent thought. Mark. And then Jeff wrote in and said, I'm currently getting caught up on Miss DTNS episodes while grading my students' tech lit portfolios. And where I live right outside Tokyo, it's currently 36 degrees Celsius. That's about 97 Fahrenheit with a heat index above 40, which is 104 Fahrenheit. Summers are hot and humid here in Japan. And I would be more than happy to try out the Rion pocket for DTNS. Thank you, Jeff. 
Uh, I, I uh, let us know how it goes if you're able to get get one, uh, and and how it goes. We we love to hear more from Jeff trying out the Rion Pocket. And uh, back to back to Mark. Uh, really good insight on what it might be good for beyond just keeping yourself cool. Thanks uh, to everybody who is emailing us uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And thanks to you, Justin Robert Young. Uh, indeed, Tom, always a pleasure to be here. And I would like to give a real big shout out to any of our big uh, tabletop fans uh, out there in the DTNS audience. If you happen to be heading out to Gen Con, uh, then uh, I want to let you know that I will be there too. And you can come see me talk. Uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. in the convention center, room uh, 111, I'm doing my talk on how to lose $40,000 on Kickstarter and how me and my co-creator, John Teasdale, made it all back and then some. And then on Saturday night, 8 p.m., playing with politics, designing games you almost certainly know will start fights. That is also at the convention center, room 232, talking about how we made our game, the contender, and the very specific design decisions we made when you are theming your game around something that means so much to people and is such a hot button topic it, like politics are. Folks, this is independent tech news. Uh, wh what you see is what you get. Uh, pretty much everybody that works on the show is on the show. Uh, Sarah was off today because she has to have another job. Uh, but this, this show is done by us. And the funding comes from you. We don't have a big corporate owner. We don't even have like big advertisers that we can always rely on to, to see us through the lean times. We got y'all and we like it that way. So thank you for supporting us. And if you're not yet supporting us, check out all the rewards that we provide for people who do support us at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Patrick Gordon. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. The Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>